The excitement is in the air. I don't know. Maybe it's because we only got a little bit of time left where everybody's still undefeated. Maybe it's because it's finally week one of the NFL season. Or maybe it's because you're hanging out with us for the 18th straight year. Fantasy Football Live coming at you right now. Kickoff is in a little over an hour. It's our job over that time to get you all set and make sure your rosters are absolute perfection. Now, you recognize Andy Barrett. You recognize Matt Harmon. They are the certified experts. I'm the new guy, Jason Fitz. We're going to be hanging out with you every Thursday. Gentlemen, just want to give you a fun fact because you're the experts. And, you know, I just think it's important to clarify uh, with the experts that I won my fantasy football league last year. So, Harmon, I don't want you to be intimidated because I'm new in the seat, but I am a champion. So, you know, no belt, no trophy, no chain or anything. But the knowledge right here, it's 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 palpable, brother. I'd like don't don't let the intimidation hit you. Well, if I wasn't intimidated by how absolutely jacked you are, uh, now I am verifiably <laughs> completely shy to, to even be on this show with you with the fact that you are a fantasy champion. It's a, a, something that, that does not happen to very many people. You know, it's not as if millions of people uh, play this game and, and fall into some luck and, and win a league every year. But, you know, hey, Fitz, I, I'm just going to try to keep up with you, buddy. Andy, I don't know if it's the buttoned-up shirt or whatever. Like, he's bringing heat. Like, I am the Hulk Hogan of this show. But I appreciate, Andy, that you guys are letting me join in on the fun. I, I for one, am honored to be joined by a fantasy champion such as yourself. Uh, I, I think that's great. If you're the Hulk Hogan, I'll, I'll listen. And I'll settle for being the, I don't know, can I be Jake the Snake? Can I be Andre the Giant? I don't know. I'll take one of the lesser wrestlers. That's fine. You, you could have got Macho Man, though, because that would I mean, you feel like I'm, we'll figure out who's who in the 80s wrestling. And I would have to do the, in the meantime, do the voice. Well, I mean, you got time. We got all year to work on that. Maybe it's a weekly thing where we practice it. All right. I want to first start with the season overall. We'll get to Thursday night in a second. But Matt, if I had to ask you one thing you're really excited for this season, what's at the top of your mind? Uh, look, every year I'm always excited about a new incoming crop of rookies. You know, there's a ton of rookie wide receivers who you could consider potentially like kind of those back half of the league or back half of the year league winners, right? Um, there's, of course, uh, Quinton Johnson with the LA Chargers. Does he start to get more playing time as the year goes on? Goes on. Zay Flowers with the Baltimore Ravens. Jackson Smith and Jig with the Seattle Seahawks. Jordan Addison, kind of the one who's going to like hit the ground running as a starter, but all of those guys could be potential back half of the year league winners and of course we got to mention Jameer Gibbs we'll talk about him plenty and Bijan Robinson the star running back for the Atlanta Falcons I mean every year for me it's these rookies who could become big values early but if even if they don't a little patience is exercise and you could grab these guys as league winners later on yeah Andy he mentioned Jameer Gibbs we'll turn this into the Jameer Gibbs show but what are you super excited for coming into this season well, uh, first of all, I'm a little nervous here because all those promises I've been making for months about Sam Laporta are about to bump up against uh, reality <laughs> tonight. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I still took the anytime TD for Laporta, just so you know. Uh, secondly, I'm I'm actually just really excited, not only that the NFL is back, but that the week one slate is as good as it is. Like the games are spectacular. First of all, Lions Chiefs tonight. That's great. We get Bills Jets. We get Giants Cowboys. We get we get Dolphins Chargers. Uh, we also get like even the bad games are good games, right? We get we get Bears Packers, we get Broncos Raiders, we get rivalry games. It is an outstanding slate this week. Did you like, bad ge Broncos Raiders bad game? Like throwing a lot of shade in case people can't tell from the jersey that's hanging that. behind me about my beloved Raiders. I, I don't know what you guys are talking about. I'll give you something quick. I'm excited about, and it is about the AFC as a whole. Because if you start to look top to bottom at the AFC overall, there are so many quarterbacks, there are so many coaches, there are so many teams that look talented enough to make the playoffs. What's interesting to me is to see how all of that plays out because there are several teams that are gonna be left on the outside looking in towards this playoff run, which means meaningful fantasy football action later in the season with everybody trying to get their way into this playoff. It's time to take a look at our fantasy game changers for this week powered by Ram Trucks. So we're gonna have a little bit of wordplay fun here, figuring out with words we love about Ram with players. So Andy, who do you think will be a capable fantasy option this week? Yeah, listen, capability is the trait that comes to mind with Khalil Herbert for me. He's Chicago's primary early down back, at least to open the season. The guy averaged 5.7 yards per carry last year on 129 rush attempts. And yeah, sometimes there's a little bit of noise in that stat, but there's not noise when it's that high a number on that many carries. 
Uh, this is just a player who gets every inch that's blocked for him and then some. Um, if he actually steps into David Montgomery's old workload, which is like 200 plus carries, we're definitely getting a thousand yard season out of Herbert. This week, he faces a Green Bay defense that allowed five yards per carry last season that ranked near the bottom of the league against the run overall. You shouldn't fear the possibility of a committee in Chicago because again, Herbert is gonna be that early down guy. You can trust him in this one. Uh, all I'm doing is looking at that truck. It's beautiful. All right, Matt, your turn now. Trustworthy is the word. Give me trustworthy. Uh, when I think of trustworthy at the wide receiver position, I think of Jahan Dotson. And anybody that's watched this guy play, dating back to his Penn State game, uh, his Penn State days, his hands are some of the most trustworthy of any receiver, even in that draft class, which was full of a ton of great players, right? Like Chris Olave and Drake Lund and Garrett Wilson. I would argue that Jahan Dotson had better hands than any of those guys. He even outkicked my expectations for him last year. Like, I really liked him as a prospect, but this is a guy who came in, I thought he'd be like a vertical slot receiver. Last year, Zach just played pure outside receiver, 87th percentile success rate versus press coverage in reception perception. Like, I think he kind of could be a Devontae Smith like player in his second year where he goes way after the first receiver drafted on his team but the gap is actually much closer than the ADP would have you suggest and you know I think it's going to get started here really nicely in week one against the Arizona Cardinals I mean Fitz can you name me any of the starters at cornerback for the Arizona Cardinals I think John Dotson gets off to a great start here you can trust him in week one look if the three of us were to take this show on the road to Arizona I think we might start this weekend but Here's the real key. I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm a champion. I won my league last year and it was oh, a dynasty oh, league. I, I heard drafted that. Jahan Dotson. So I like this. Like I see you guys unintentionally. You just keep building me up. That's what, that's what I love about you guys. Andy, let's get you another word here. Let's go with fast. What do you have for fast? Yeah, first of all, I'm definitely not trying to check Jahan Dotson. I, I would I would certainly fake a hamstring injury before it came to that. Um, when you think of fast, I want you to think of Denver rookie Marvin Mims. That guy ran a 4.3840 at the combine. It paired nicely with his near 40 inch vertical. So we're talking about a rare athlete even by the standards of the NFL. Guy averaged 19 and a half yards per reception over a three year collegiate career at Oklahoma. He was great there, a big play machine. He's also the first draft choice of the Sean Payton era in Denver. The team traded up to get him. They're excited about him. Injuries have given him a really clean path to snaps and targets. He's the team's wide receiver three right now at worst. Denver is also about to, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm about to kind of tell it like it is about the Vegas Raiders, uh, but they're about to face a <laughs> Vegas defense that ranked 29th against the pass last season. Um, maybe you're not ready to start a rookie in opening week, but I want you to at least consider stashing Mims for later use. I'm going to be in public when this game is on. It doesn't serve me well at all if this shade continues. All right, that's fine. No matter what you're looking for in a light duty truck, the 2023 Ram 1500 has you covered. Score yours at Ram. Dot com. I, I don't know why I keep taking all of this shade from you guys. Uh, I need help. You need help. Your eyes don't deceive you. If you're just tuning in, obviously we're here to get you helped for tonight's uh, Thursday night kickoff, but also for the entire weekend. So let's have a little bit of make your pick. We're going to look at some tough flex decisions. People are asking. They're chiming in. Here's one for you. 16 team PPR need to start two. Mitchell, Charbonnet, Gainwell, Johnston, Peoples-Jones. Uh, let's start with you, Matt. What do you got on this one? Yeah, 16 team, no kidding. We're coming in strong here with a deep, deep format. Uh, look, I think the two guys here that stand out in terms of we know they're going to get clear playing time. I'd love to tell you Quinton Johnson is an option, but I think he's going to be the fourth receiver for the Chargers in week one. Kenny Gainwell, it's going to be a mysterious running back room in Philly all year long, but I buy that he is the most trustworthy, I mean, talk about trustworthy, reliable guy in this backfield. I will go with him for one of the options against the New England Patriots. And for the second one, give me Donovan Peoples-Jones. I think he is still gonna be at least third, maybe even second in routes run at the wide receiver position for the Cleveland Browns. It should be a high scoring, high point total affair uh, against the Cincinnati Bengals, a little AFC North rivalry there. So it, this is a deep format. I trust the playing time of those two guys the most. Andy, you want to critique that at all? 
Uh, no, actually, I, I like oh. that call. I think it's a, a sneaky good call on uh, on Peoples Jones in particular. Um, the the Kenny Gainwell situation is so is so murky. I just love that we led with a question about a 16 team league with names that are as messy as this. Come in heavy, look, man. It's week it's week one. We got to talk about some superstars here. Elijah Mitchell and and Kenny Gainwell. <laughs> That's what the people need to know. I've learned this in the last few days as we put some of these tweets out. Like, people are coming in hard. Derek comes in. I need one for a running back spot and one for flex spot. Standard PPR. Cook, Sanders, Mostert, and more. Any advice would be great. Thanks. Thank you, Derek. Andy, what do you think on this one? Um, this is – so th this one's messy because, man, I have these three running backs probably within, like, five or six spots in the ranks. Um, and I can make arguments for all of them. I think I would go Miles Sanders here. Um, he's just got such a clean path to like 24, 25 touches in this one. Um, that receiving core is really banged up. I don't think the game flow is gonna get away from him. I think they're gonna have to lean on him. So if I'm just picking one here, Sanders is the guy. All right, let's get another one in here so we can keep sharing the love. Remember, you guys can chime in and get your questions in for us. And by doing that, uh, we'll get an answer for you. We've got Pacheco, Weider, Moster, two run, one sits, and half PPR. Who you got? Matt, you're up. What do you think? Weirdly, I feel the most confident in Raheem Moster here. This guy was fifth in rushing success rate on zone rushing plays last year. That is the primary run scheme of the Miami Dolphins. He's a perfect scheme fit for them. healthy guy on the offense right now. The deal with Raheem Mostert is he's here for a good time. He ain't here for a long time. So while he's here, you got to enjoy him against the LA Chargers run defense. It was not very good last year. And for my second spot here, I'm just so sketched out by this Baker Mayfield Buccaneers offense experience. So I will go with Isaiah Pacheco here. Should be able to potentially bang in a touchdown, maybe get over 60 rushing yards against the run defense in Detroit that didn't do a lot in the offseason, wasn't very good last year. So I'll go with the offense that I've got more trust in with Isaiah Pacheco. We've got a little bit of chatter out there in the Yahoo Fantasy app. Remember, we've got a user comment area where you guys can go out, debate with each other, chime in. So got some interesting comments in on Brees Hall, on Jameer Gibbs, who obviously we're talking about. But this one really stood out to me. Cooper Cup, when healthy, this man rivals Justin Jefferson for best receiver in the league. Got him in the third round. That's ludicrous, which I also appreciate that Ryan capitalized ludicrous. Andy, I don't know. We putting Cooper Cup in the same category as ludicrous or Justin Jefferson? Um, that that sounds like somebody who's trying to market Cooper Cup as a as a potential fantasy trade, honestly, <laughs> to me. Um, I, I mean, I do like we should acknowledge that Cooper Cup delivered one of the signature seasons in NFL history just a couple years ago. He's great. If we felt a little bit better about the team context, if we felt better about Stafford's health, if Cooper Cup himself were not such an injury risk, we don't know how many games he's going to miss, but it's probably going to be more than one. That doesn't sound good. Also, like. Justin Jefferson is 24 years old and his career is off to a perfect start. And I think he's probably going to be the first receiver in NFL history to go over 2000 yards in a season. So we're putting him in pretty fine company if we lump him in with Jefferson. That's some of our thoughts. Remember, you can keep getting your thoughts into the app. You just look for the discussion tab in the fantasy football app. and You guys can talk with each other. We'll continue to bring those up on the show. All right. One of the biggest acquisitions we've seen, I don't know, not, not just this year, but in years, is Aaron Rodgers to the New York Jets. And gentlemen, as much as we're focused on Thursday night football, we all know that Monday night we're going to see the debut of that that counts. Here's where I'm coming from, though, through all of it. As much as Aaron Rodgers gets this pass of, hey, last year was the thumb and it's going to be better, I'm looking squarely at the AFC East. I'm seeing a Buffalo team that went 13-3 and last year in a year that was not great for them. They still won 13 games. I look at a Miami team that's stacked with talent. I could see a real path where Aaron Rodgers and the Jets don't even make the playoffs. They're the third best team in their own division. Matt, like, are we overhyping a little bit of this Aaron Rodgers to the Jets thing? Man, you even mentioned the New England Patriots who had a great defense last year and their head coach is newly single. So he's uh, going to be looking to come out hot this year. You know, he's got, he's got some things to prove. Uh, no, but on a serious note, well, semi-serious note, I, I do think that Rodgers and the Jets, I think the experiment will work. I think 
Last year, look, he just didn't have anybody reliable and trustworthy to throw to, especially working on big boy NFL routes over the middle of the field, like working against press coverage. And the real difference maker here is that he's going to be paired with Garrett Wilson. I mean, Garrett Wilson is a phenomenal talent. 81.2% uh, success rate versus press last year in reception perception. Like, the guy has it all to be a superstar in this league. I think that connection will be enough to make this offense viable if the defense remains very good and Brees Hall and Dalvin Cook can form a dynamic one-two punch. I don't think this is going to be necessarily like Tom Brady going to the Bucks and, and throwing for, you know, over 700 passes a year or Peyton Manning to go to the Broncos and, like, everybody becomes a fantasy starter. I mean, their number two receiver might be Alan Lazard. So I do understand the skepticism here, but overall I think they will be a competitive team in the AFCs. But like you mentioned, it is not going to be an easy road. Andy, you buying that? Yeah, the other thing we probably have to talk about with Rodgers is the fact that, you know, he like he turns 40 this season. There's there have not been a lot of years historically, you know, I, OK, Tom Brady did it like six times after the age of 40. But other than Brady, there's like one season by Brett Favre, half a season by Drew Brees and nobody else has been great after the age of 40. So it's tough. I mean, that's that's life in the NFL, right? Um, on top of that, Rodgers was fine last year, but he wasn't obviously the MVP version of himself. You mentioned the thumb issue. Perhaps that was it. Perhaps it was just the talent and the and the pedigree and the receiving core. Uh, I agree with Matt that Garrett Wilson is an absolute emerging star. And so we can reasonably expect, you know, not only Garrett Wilson to be phenomenal this season, but for him to perhaps uplift, uh, uplift Aaron Rodgers just a little bit as well. Finished as the QB 13 last year in fantasy. I don't, I don't think his ceiling is a whole lot higher than that. Can he finish top 10? Sure. I don't see another MVP season. I don't see another top five-ish fantasy finish for him. Part of the reason, again, is that like all the defenses in this division are, are really frisky. Uh, and we're going to see that this week against Buffalo. We're using frisky as a term for a good deep. Like, is is it good to be a frisky defense, Andy? Like, we, we feel confident about we're going to go with frisky? Uh, Harvard's yeah, thinking that, but when it's, it's one versus two on prep. You're in on frisky, too? Like, are we all in on frisky? Yeah, we're in, yeah, we're in on frisky. It doesn't promise that they're going to be great, but it promises gonna, they're going to be frisky, you know? Like, uh, that just, that sounds, uh, you know, you're keeping the expectations. If you're, if you're more comfortable there. with zesty, we could go with zesty. It's your, hey, it's zesty your show. works. I just want I want one time to see Belichick stand at the podium and say, you know what? That defense was frisky today and see how it goes. All right. Uh, we're going to get frisky now. We got to get to some primetime picks. Uh, nothing is is right unless we compete for it. So well, it's time to bring a little competition into this. And this is super easy. What we're going to do is a snake draft. All three of us are participating in this. They say a randomizer decided on the draft order. Somehow the randomizer gave Andy the first pick and by the way, gave Matt the turn, which sticks the new guy in the middle of all of this but here's what we're gonna do we're only gonna use the primetime game so we're gonna have three picks you got to pick one from tonight's game you have to pick one from the sunday night game and you have to pick one player from the monday night game that way we're just like you we're sweating bullets on monday night football we will accumulate the points and we will see each week who wins at the end there will be a massive massive undetermined prize i heard unconfirmed it's 18 million dollars of monopoly money i don't know it's just a mega prize so are we ready for this andy you have the first pick so any right now the world is your oyster any player from any of those three games who you got first yeah, I'm sure we're going to have some dog games later in the year, but the primetime slate is so good this week. Um, there's no clunkers to choose from here. I'm, I'm going Tony Pollard at the top. Um, Dalton Del Don eventually just sort of wore me down on Pollard, uh, forced me to get a little bit more of him in my fantasy life. This guy was the overall RB8 last season, and he did it without almost any red zone touches. Um, all of that workload went to Zeke Elliott, right? Um, if he just takes a slice of that, a little slice of that this season, if we get him up to like 260, 270 touches, he's going to have a monster year. And this year, he begins against the New York Giants, a defense that allowed 5.2 yards per carry last season. He's going to go off this week. I think he's a pretty clear number one here. Uh, that's the right position, but the wrong player, because the clear number one to me is Saquon. I'm going Saquon number two, and this has everything to do with just we know that, frankly, they paid him because they're going to churn him and burn him all year long to get everything they can out of him. Number two is just the key to the offense for him. So I think Darren Waller, while that's a great story and he's going to put up some big fantasy numbers, Saquon's going to be Saquon in that game. So I like Saquon at number two. I feel like I'm stealing candy from a baby. Matt, what you got? 
Listen, as the uh, lead lobbyist for Big Receiver, I got to introduce a different position here. I will go with Stefan Diggs as the third pick here. I really like the game environment between the Bills and the Jets. I know these are two frisky defenses, but these are two offenses that should be efficient. And Diggs is just so proven, so consistent. He's a matchup proof guy. Yeah, Sauce Gardner and the boys are good over there in New York, but Diggs is just at a different level right now. So I'll go with him. And again, which should be a high scoring environment. Coming back around on my next pick, I'll go back to that Dallas game, but I will go with the wide receiver here. I'll go CD Lamb. CD Lamb absolutely feasted. Last year, when the uh, Dallas Cowboys were blitzed, CeeDee Lamb's targets per route run were just insanely high. The Giants blitzed more than any other team in the NFL. CeeDee Lamb stung him for big games in both of the matchups last year, so I think he's a great pick to bring the second round to fold here. I'm a little surprised none of us have picked tonight's game because tonight's game without Kelsey becomes slim pickings in my mind, so I'm going to go there now. I'm going to do Amon Ross St. Brown uh, just to get a wide receiver that I can trust. I, I don't know that I can just like, I think Kadarius Tony could be great, but that's a big could. Uh, St. Brown is going to be great in this game. So I feel like that it's a solid pick to go wide receiver from the Lions in this situation because it's the only proven entity and I'm desperate not to get stuck with somebody I don't want out of the Thursday night football game. So that brings it back to you, Andy. What do you got, good sir? Oh, I just had that terrible fantasy feeling of getting sniped. I would have loved to land Amon Ross St. Brown here. I think he's the pretty clear number one from that game. Uh, but I'm going to take Jameer Gibbs. Talked about him a little bit earlier. Again, Detroit offensive coordinator Ben Johnson has pledged to surprise us with Gibbs' usage this season. I am here for it. The total in this game is the highest of the week. It should be an absolute shootout. Again, I, I just think of Gibbs as, a, as an absolute do-it-all player. Um, the game environment is fantastic. He should catch five or six balls in this one. So I, I think he's I think he's a pretty appealing player here. My next pick, I'm going Garrett Wilson. Uh, and it would have been it would have been tight for me between Garrett Wilson and Stefan Diggs. Um, I, I just think Wilson, you know, kind of cooked Buffalo last year, caught 14 balls against them, 170 yards. And that was with that rogues gallery of quarterbacks that the Jets trotted out. Uh, now he gets Aaron Rodgers. And maybe I'm not bullish on Aaron Rodgers in fantasy for the full season, but I fully acknowledge how much much better he is than anybody that was throwing Garrett Wilson the football last year. Yeah, I, I think I misplayed my hand a little bit here because while that's the huge matchup going to get big numbers, I don't have much left there and it's the only game I can go to. So I'm going to go to Dalvin Cook. Just going to hope that Dalvin Cook comes in and is the back that he thinks he's going to be in that situation. Or James Cook. Dalvin Cook. James Cook. Uh, I'm going to go with James there, uh, you know, and, and see if I can get that running back help out of that. That's the only option I got left. All right. And next to you, Matt. I really want to take my guy Sky Moore here. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna do it. Not because I'm a coward, <laughs> but because I'm gonna take David Montgomery. Because simply the proposition of taking Montgomery uh, when Andy finds out that the big surprise role for Jameer Gibbs, like it always is with these running backs, is oh he can catch passes and run the ball too. Oh boy, like they, that's always what these coaches talk about. Some unique role for a pass catching running back, and it ends up being a space back just like anyone else. Dave Montgomery is going to get the early down carries against the Chiefs defense without Chris Jones. We haven't mentioned that yet. He can catch passes too a little bit. I mean, it's just be great to look at Andy Barons. You know, imagine him crying and weeping as Dave Montgomery, a former Bears running back, bangs in two touchdowns tonight. The best part about all of this is that I cannot wait for the trash talking in the group text on Monday night. Just like y'all, we're going to be going at it, and we'll see how I this thing will be thing, muting that. Uh, that will out. be muted. Uh, okay. Right. You're not supposed to tell us when you, you know what, I, I can't handle you guys. All right. What I can't handle is Sal Vetri, the expert. He joins us every single week. He's going to give us some unique takes that you can only get here, including this week, Sal's seven keys that you haven't thought of for your fantasy league. Hello, beautiful people. I'm Sal Vetri, and these are the seven key findings you need to know for week one. We begin with finding number one, the best spot of the week. This title belongs to Brian Robinson, who enters week one as a seven point favorite against the Cardinals last ranked defense from a year ago. In this Arizona unit just lost JJ Watt, Marcus Golden, and Zach Allen this off season. Now in three games as a favorite last year, Brian Robinson averaged 13 fantasy points. Get him in your lineup week one. Finding number two takes us to a reliable streamer. You want to 
pick up and play Cowboys tight end Jake Ferguson. Ferguson is a former fourth round pick with strong college production. He earned 28% of Wisconsin's offensive production, which is more than Dalton Schultz had in college. And I bring that up because Dalton Schultz was a top 10 tight end the past two seasons with Dak Prescott. Now, Ferguson earned the eighth most yards per route run, his tight end efficiency among all tight ends last year. And now he's going to run more routes. Key finding number three gets messy. It's the Colts backfield. There's no Jonathan Taylor, a questionable Zach Moss, and Deion Jackson is projected to start. Let me just make this easy on you. Just avoid this backfield. Now, Deion Jackson was solid last season at a starter. Heck, he even posted 28 points in one game. But Jackson relies on receiving work to find success. He was just 70th on the ground as a rusher last year. And now his receiving work should be limited, playing with mobile quarterback Anthony Richardson, who only targeted running backs 5% of the time last year in college. Key finding number four is the sketchy spot of the week. And that sketchy spot is Najee Harris, who will face the 49ers stout defensive line that might not have Nick Bosa, but does have new addition Javon Hargrave from the Eagles. And this defense features the number one linebacker unit in the league, led by Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw. Against top 10 defenses last season, Najee averaged an RB25 finish, and now he has Jalen Warren earning more usage. If you have a viable replacement, consider sitting Najee. Finding number five takes us to a surprising name in the top 10 rankings. And this man's name is Jamal Williams. With Alvin Kamara suspended and rookie Kendra Miller injured, Williams is expected to handle the entire workload for New Orleans. It's not an ideal matchup against the Titans, but Williams is a favorite and will run behind strong run blockers Trevor Penning and Ryan Ramchek. And check this out. In 15 career starts, Williams averages 17 fantasy points on 21 touches per game. Finding number six is quietly concerning, and it's the Texans offensive line. This unit is now down three starters in the past week alone, with guard Kenyon Martin and rookie center Juice Struggs hitting the IR. Not to mention, Houston's going to enter week one as a 10-point underdog in Baltimore, the largest underdog of the week. All of this is really bad news for the Texans offense, but more importantly, Damian Pierce. In four games as a big underdog last season, Pierce averaged just 10 points per game. Now, key number seven is the most important. It's the trade secret. This is a tip for fantasy trades after week one. It's all about catering to your league mates needs, not your own wants. Simply research their team and identify which positions they need to improve most. You want to show them that you've done the work and a conversation is worth their time. Trading in fantasy is basically sales. Get your league mates feeling good about your interaction and it takes down any walls that they might have to trade with you. So these are the seven key findings for this week. Now all that's left to do is for you to go ahead and implement them and smack around your opponent for week one. So much good stuff there, but Sal, my friend, I got to start with your last point because I love everything you're saying about sort of building a relationship. How like how long should I spend building that relationship before I throw out my first trade offer? Well, I, th this could be different in a lot of leagues. It could be if you already know the people, if they're buddies from home, if it's your cousin, I mean, you don't have to wait too long, but maybe you're in a, a new work league. Maybe you're somebody new on the block like me here. Well, you got to kind of get to know some people. You can't just be charging in there. So you have to give it a little bit of a feel out period. But honestly, right now, before week one, after week one, as long as you have some sort of connection with the people in your league is a fair time to trade. So walk me through this too, because as I've told the guys 472 times tonight, I'm a defending champion, but it was in a, a dynasty league, right? So is there some like dynasty league mentality where like maybe if I got a trade that's not the best, but it's okay, I just take it to try and build a little future equity so that I can make a better trade later? Yeah, I mean, I think that's something I personally have never done in Dynasty. That would be probably your only place to really do that. But it's not a bad idea if you want to go one step further in terms of the whole uh, trading can be like sales. I think that's not a bad idea. You could also go even another step further from that and say, hey, if this is a package deal, two for one. I'll go find this guy. I'll research the waivers for you and tell you the best options because I'm that good of a person for you. Let's get this deal done. Look at that. I already want to hug you just to the screen. By the way, you can check out more of Sal's work on the Fantasy Yahoo app, of course, and follow him uh, at Sal Vetri, DFS on social media. Sal, we're going to have some fun with some play calling here. Going to bring the guys in and get some more questions from everybody that's trying to figure out how to fix their rosters going into tonight. We bring the whole group together and let's bring up our first question that we've gotten this one. A little bit of wide receiver love here. Sky Moore or Terry McLaurin this week? I know I've already heard Matt wax uh, on and on and on about Sky Moore but uh, tell me what you think on this one Sal yeah so this is this just got a lot more interesting because of today we got news that Terry McLaurin was a full participant in practice there was a lot of news is this guy gonna miss multiple weeks it's a turf toe injury that can linger it could be two weeks it could be eight weeks well he's a full participant it looks like as of now on Thursday he's gonna go but all of that said the commanders are seven point favorites is that really a spot where they're gonna throw a lot more in the second half 
Sky Moore comes into a game where the expectations are now totally different than when you had your fantasy draft. Based on your fantasy draft, you're probably starting Terry McLaurin, the fifth or sixth round pick that you got, not Sky Moore in round 10. But we know Travis Kelsey is not going to be playing tonight. This team still in the Kansas City Chiefs has a 29 point team total. And who are they going to be throwing it to? Well, you have a downfield receiver in Marquez Valdez-Scantlin, a fill-in tight end, a rotation of running backs, and then there's Sky Moore, a second-year player who last year, look, he was a young player coming from a smaller school, but more importantly, they signed two receivers last year, Juju Smith-Schuster and Marquez Valdez-Scantlin. Juju's no longer there. Sky Moore will fill that role now in a spot with a 29 and a half point team total. And oh yeah, Patrick Mahomes. Even if he's not great at getting targets, he's going to see five or six tonight just because he's out there running 30 plus routes. All right, now that I've trash talked Matt, uh, we should get Matt in on this one. Let's pull another uh, question up and see where we are on this one. Uh, this one goes to Matt. Zay Flowers, Odell Beckham, or Michael Thomas for my last wide receiver spot. Matt, what you think? Oh, man, you know, we did get news today that uh, Odell Beckham was limited in practice, but I still think he's probably my answer here. I, I, Michael Thomas, man, is just such an unknown. Like, is he going to play a full complement of snaps? Can he play a full complement of snaps at this point in his career? You know, Zay Flowers is a rookie. I kind of think the one guy in Baltimore I know is going to be on the field as long as he's healthy uh, between these three receivers. You, know, you got Rashad Bateman, you got Zay Flowers. I think those guys will split that second receiver spot. I'm a big Bateman fan. I'm a huge Zay Flowers fan. I just think it's aggressive in his first um, his first NFL game. It is between the two Ravens guys. So if you get more bad news about Odo Beckham's practice participation, I think you can go to Zay Flowers. But for now, all things being equal against the Houston defense, you know, the Ravens are 10 point favorites. Uh, I I'm going to go ahead and take Odo Beckham here. All right, let's get one more in because Andy needs to play in the sandbox too. Andy, let's pull one up here and see what the what question we've got for you. And it's a quarterback one. Anthony Richardson or Geno Smith? What do you think? Yeah, um, I, I I get that. Uh, you know, most leagues you don't want to you don't want to have two quarterbacks necessarily on the roster in a one QB league. Um, I get why you have Anthony Richardson there. Obviously, the ceiling there extremely high. The floor extremely high. I'd, I'd probably want to wait and see in week one before I rolled him out there. Um, not perhaps the most accurate passer during the preseason. Um, we know the rushing stats are going to be there. We don't know exactly what the passing numbers are going to look like. We don't really know what the passing offense is going to look like or what the volume is going to be. It's probably going to be low. I do know that Geno Smith is coming off a tremendous season. He was the QB five overall last year. I also know that his receiving core is just about the best in the business, right? And they're all healthy right now. I feel really good about Geno in this matchup. It's it's clearly a case where I would expect Seattle to get out to a lead. I think they are pretty comfortably a favorite in that one, or should be. Um, but really, I, I think Geno throws minimum two touchdowns in this one, maybe three. I think he's a very strong play here. Welcome back to Fantasy Football Live. I'm Jason Fitz. I'm the new guy. Your eyes do not deceive you. We've also got Andy Barron's Matt Harmon. We're going to be with you not only tonight, but every single Thursday leading into the Thursday night game. We appreciate you hanging out with us. Want to get you updated on some of the injury reports that we got coming out of practices today. Some significant names on here. Cooper Cup out. George Kittle with the groin injury. Christian Watson with the hamstring. Jerry Judy with the hamstring. Christian Watson, 95% rostered. Judy, 91% roster Andy do you see any of these names that go full panic mode yeah I'd be a little I'm a little panicky on Christian Watson I will, will say I don't have a ton of him myself um, maybe that's just a Packer thing but Christian Watson not practicing on Thursday is a is a pretty big worry. Uh, Romeo Dobbs did return to practice. That's something. They've got young Luke Musgrave, but that is a very young receiving core. And Christian Watson is just a fundamentally different player from any other receiver there, right? Just athletically, size-wise, um, in terms of production last year, he's he's on a different plane. Um, so if they are without Watson, that's a that's a huge worry. And yeah, I'd be I'd be a little panicky. I mean, Matt, where are you on Jerry Judy at this point? Because injuries, productivity, like it just hasn't come together for Judy the way a lot of us thought it would coming out of college, right? Yeah, man, I, I've been down on Judy all offseason compared to consensus even before the injury. He's a volatile player. He's an inconsistent guy, as you mentioned, on and off the field with injuries. Even when he's been on the field, I don't think he's lived up to the billing that he's this great route runner. I haven't seen that from a consistent basis. He shows the flashes. It's just not all the way there. I think this wide receiver room in Denver is 
wide open. You know, Sean Payton comes to town. He's not committed to anybody here. I mean, yeah, they pick up the fifth-year option on Jerry Judy. People act like that's this big indicator. Pick up the fifth-year option is no big deal. Cortland Sutton, you know, they shopped him around. They shopped Jerry Judy around. The rookie receiver there, Marvin Mims, is, is interesting. He was the first pick, as Andy mentioned, of the Sean Payton regime. But I'm willing to kind of believe anything about this Denver wide receiver room. I think if Jerry Judy misses any time, he's going to be uh, in jeopardy of kind of falling behind the pecking order because it's Sean Payton teams now. It's Sean Payton's team now, and everybody's got a blank slate here. I mean, if Sean Payton wanted to wait until week two or three to figure that wide receiver room out, that'd be just fine <laughs> with me for obvious reasons. <laughs> all right. So from guys that do one thing and they're just trying to get on the field, let's take a look at dual threats. We all know that somebody that can come in and do multiple things can be an absolute key for success and extra points when it comes to fantasy football. So we'll start with Matt here. Who's the dual threat that you've got your eyes on? When we got this segment, man, I knew I had to make a stand on Miles Sanders here. All offseason, he leaves the Philadelphia Eagles. He goes to the Carolina Panthers, and people keep telling you, oh, he can't catch passes. He can't go pa He can't catch passes. He never did it in Philadelphia. Well, meanwhile, Panthers offensive coordinator Thomas Brown talks about what he's seen from Miles Sanders. says, being able to have three down capabilities, play between the tackles, play in space, also try to find some matchups for him. They went out and signed this guy because they believe he is a three down back that who can who could be an efficient rusher, but also play in the passing game. And of course he didn't catch passes in Philadelphia. If you're Jalen Hurts and you drop back to pass, you see AJ Brown first, then you go to Devontae Smith, then you go to Dallas Goddard. Those are all great options. And hey, if it doesn't work out with any of them, you can just run it yourself. The Carolina Panthers do not have any options like that in the pass game. So I say you can book Miles Sanders for four plus catches on Sunday against the Atlanta Falcons, a gettable defense in its own right. I mean, come on, let's try to think a little critically here. The, the number one question I have here is, was that the voice? Like I've heard about the famous voice that you give of fan. Was that, was that, was that the first pass of the voice? It was strong, Armin. Like that was strong work by you. You know, I, I wasn't I wasn't really ready to bring it out, but then this Miles Sanders uh, segment just brought it out of me. Uh, listen, if you're offended by the voice, uh, maybe you think you belong in the fantasy dork club or whatever. But listen, I'm not talking about you, fantasy football live viewers, because you guys are smart. You you folks out there are dialed in. All right. So it's not about you. But it's about the other people in your fantasy league. All right, I'm going to give you a dual threat now. And uh, it, look, it's going to sound like a homer pick, but I promise it isn't. I'm just saying Josh Jacobs right now is RB8 uh, oh, and, and across the board. But here's the thing. Look at Josh Jacobs' success overall against the Denver Broncos. It has been incredible. Look at the Raiders' success over the course of the last couple of years against the Denver Broncos. It's been very strong. Now you bring in the fact that Jimmy G is not the type of quarterback that's going to sit back in the back of the pocket and look to just shove it downfield to Devontae Adams. That's not going to be there. Even though Josh missed most of the training camp period. That doesn't matter. All reports out of Vegas is that he took the best care of himself ever this offseason, and he's going to come in fresh and ready to dominate. Josh Jacobs is going to be great in the backfield. He's going to be great coming out of the backfield to catch passes. I think they're going to use him a lot in outlet because I'm still not sure what that offensive line is going to look like against the Broncos defense. I actually really like Jacobs here as a dual threat, and I'm, I usually stay against Raiders because I don't want to get my heart broken twice, but I feel good about this one, Andy. So that, that's, that's my dual threat. Brett, uh, what do you got for us? Oh, first of all, I really feel like football is back now that Harmon did the voice. Now that he did the random football fan <laughs> voice, that that really got to me. Uh, I listen. I've spent my entire off season, the whole summer, talking myself into the Sam Howell-led Washington offense being kind of a sneaky powerhouse. That means that I am once again in on Antonio Gibson. Um, he looks like he's going to be a near equal partner in the backfield job share there, along with Brian Robinson. Gibson is certainly the most gifted receiving option in that backfield. Already has a pair of 40 catch seasons to his credit. Also a pair of thousand scrimmage yard seasons uh, on the resume. He's just an exceptional dual threat back in Eric Bieniemy's offense. I, I trust him to be utilized properly. He's about to face a super vulnerable Arizona defense, a team that might not even really be trying to win. I mean, they're probably trying to win, but what do they really have? Um, what is not to like this week? I, I get that maybe this is a little bit down the ranks. He's certainly not up there with Josh Jacobs, but man, I consider Gibson a really sneaky good flex option this week.
Yeah, and it seems like a sneaky good strategy every week to just find who's playing the Cardinals and make sure they're in your lineup. It, it, that's a great call by you. That's a little taste of some of our expertise. We're going to keep it going, but we're going to bring in even more experts because every week we'll take a deep dive with special guests from around the fantasy community. So Matt and TJ Hernandez of 4 for 4 are going to break down some fantasy flyers. Gentlemen, take it away. All right, TJ, you DFS maven, you. You're here to help us dive deep into some plays for week one. Yes. Let's continue the good vibes with the Washington Commanders here for with your first pick. Yeah, I was um, busy, but I heard Andy uh, put out the Sam Howell bat call, so I, I came a-running. Uh, Sam Howell is... Um, he, he's my, my DFS play of the week, also one of the top streamers of the week. We have Sam Howell as a top two quarterback value on 4 for 4 uh, on Yahoo DFS. He's one of seven quarterbacks projected for at least 30 rushing yards on 4 for 4 this week, uh, but only five of those guys on the main slate. Most of those guys are the high price quarterbacks, so we're getting that rushing floor with Sam Howell. If we get to that 40 rushing yard um, uh, number, that is a passing touchdowns worth of fantasy points preseason 28 of 37 passing 7.2 yards per attempt three touchdowns no interceptions and uh, a lot of people might think sam howell's a floor play but if we're playing against arizona i think everybody playing arizona is a ceiling play this year i think he's got the receivers to drag him to that ceiling as well so i love that call next one up here i know you've got a running back injury always creates opportunity at this position yes. tj uh, yeah, running back, a lot of injury in the Miami backfield. Obviously, no uh, Jeff Wilson. And then Devin Achain, also a couple injuries in preseason, caused him to miss some time. That's always super crucial for a rookie. That opens the door for Raheem Mostert. $15 on Yahoo, a game with a 51 point total, a spread of just three points. So we expect Miami to keep it close, maybe even pull it out. Not too worried about game script, but very interested in the scoring upside here. Chargers, one of the biggest run funnels last year 25th and four for four schedule adjusted fantasy points allowed to the position i mean he's not even a flex play we have him as a starter right now we have him ranked as our rb24 on four for four but he's priced as the rb30 on yahoo so he is a top five value for us and a guy that we should be jamming into lineups in every format Man, it's a weird world when we're talking about Raheem Mostert as like a must-start guy in week one. But, yeah. dude, I, I'm here for it, man. I, I'm with you on this one. Next one up here, let's, let's twist that knife just a little bit further with Fitz's Raiders and talk about a rookie receiver in this game. Yeah, not a surprise. Week one, a lot of these uh, guys that we're talking about are beneficiaries of injury. Uh, assuming Jerry Judy is out. Marvin Mims has a chance to lead the Broncos in targets against a Raiders team that was uh, bottom 10 in yards allowed to wide receivers last year. Mims priced down at $12 on Yahoo this week. This is a guy that Sean Payton traded up for in his first draft with the Broncos. Uh, one of my friends that I'm very close to compared him to a John Brown or a T.Y. Hilton. We love that. He Ooh, shined in like the preseason. He's, yeah, yeah, he is a smart guy. Uh, we saw Mims shine in the preseason, especially in that week three game. Uh, he is a DFS play that is just a smash. If you're in a redraft league, I mean, he's kind of on that fringe in a two wide receiver league, probably a little thin and three wide receiver league with the flex. I could see him cracking my starting lineup. Love that. Uh, by the way, I am the friend that, T that TJ was talking about. We, we are friends. And if you're not excited by the name John Brown, I mean, come on. If you know, you know, that's a big time comparison when it comes from me. Last guy up here. Let's stay on the rookie theme. Typically, we have our expectations low on these rookie tight ends, TJ. But you are saying eh, maybe not so fast with this guy. Yeah, Andy mentioned no Christian Watson at practice today. Uh, Romeo Dobbs did return, but still, uh, you know, questionable tag on him as of now. If either of these guys are out, it gives Luke Musgrave a big boost. But even if they're healthy, I mean, Musgrave led the team in targets when Jordan Love was on the field in the preseason. Uh, he's probably going to be on the field for virtually every snap. Uh, he's right on that starter um, fringe for us this week projected as the tight end 13 on four for four down at the stone minimum ten dollars so this game isn't going to be a barn burner by any means but this is a guy that uh, especially if those injuries come into fruition could lead the team in targets maybe double digit targets for musgrave in week one I see it. Hey, man, we're talking Raheem Mostert is a top 24 back. We're talking must-start rookie tight ends. What a fun Love world. It. 
in this fantasy game we play. Hey, TJ, appreciate you jumping by here. You got to check out TJ's work at 4 for 4. You got to check him out on social media at TJ Hernandez because he is the absolute truth. But what's not always the truth, sometimes the numbers, they do lie. Let's have Fitz and Andy break it down for us. Oh, you know what, Matt? Just mute me on Sunday when the Raiders got. Just mute me. Okay, Andy, uh, look, numbers, uh, this is this is a simple, simple concept here with some complicated numbers all around it because sometimes we see great numbers, but they mean nothing. So what are, what are some of the numbers that are standing out to you that are actually uh, maybe not all that uh, all that important this year? Yeah, I'm going to talk eight dot average depth of target with a couple of different quarterbacks from last season. I want to start with Justin Fields. He had an A dot of 9.5 last year. That, that was among the highest in the league, and it was definitely a contributing factor in his low completion percentage. It was certainly a contributing factor in the fact that he led the NFL in sacks with 55. Um, it's a worry, and I don't think we're going to see it going forward, right? It's got to come down. This is really where new arrival DJ Moore can help. Um, the Bears just need layups in the offense. They need quick stuff. They need yards after the catch opportunities. And I think they finally have a receiver who can actually uncover quickly and do those things. Last year, Fields was thrown to, to Mooney, to Dante Pettis, to a lesser St. Brown, right? It was just, it was probably the worst receiving core in the league. Uh, if he is gonna unlock just the massive fantasy potential that we can see in Justin Fields, he's gonna need chain moving throws, right? Um, he's gonna need quick and easy stuff. We're also probably gonna need some passing volume. So I am very interested to see where the dot sits for this offense as a whole and for fields as we get through September. It's a little stunning to me because we all know the knock last year was that offensive line was just hot garbage, right? So you put that hot garbage on an offensive line. I'm surprised to see a depth of target that's that deep, right? Like it feels like the whole thing this year is going to look different for the Bears. So it's part of the reason that I'm sort of hesitant to do anything with Chicago until we see where that $90 million was spent. What the, what's next for you when it comes to the numbers? Well, same stat. I want to look at Justin Herbert. Because uh, Herbert, like on the other end of the spectrum, a guy, by the way, with just a weapons grade arm, right? Like incredible arm strength, outstanding receivers. He can't finish near the bottom of the league again in ADOT. His ADOT last year was just seven. Um, it should have been a national scandal, honestly. Like he ranked 29th last season in percentage of throws that traveled 20 or more yards downfield. We don't want to see that. And like, with all due respect to Austin Eckler, wonderful player they shouldn't build the entire passing game around him. Um, they need to get deep, they need to get vertical. Uh, obviously last year, Herbert was also playing through injury, right? That was part of the issue. Keenan Allen misses several weeks. That was, that was an issue. So there were some headwinds there. I am just trusting new offensive coordinator, Kellen Moore, to fix this, to get vertical. I think we're gonna see it against Miami in the opener. Let's just, let's just target Eli Apple a few times and see what happens. I just am imagining now an entire crowd chant of like fix is a dot. Uh, 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 I don't know. I, I'm just I'm just <laughs> improvising here. Okay, give us the next one on your list of numbers that uh, will look a little different this year. Yeah, uh, the final thing that I, I think we just need to underline for people and is definitely going to look different this year. Um, Baltimore last season ranked near the bottom of the league in pass attempts and dropbacks. Um, they only attempted 28.7 passes per game. Uh, Todd Munkin is in town now as the new OC, and he just does not operate that way. Hasn't done it historically. He was the OC in Tampa for some wild Jameis Winston, Ryan Fitzpatrick years, right? Um, this should be fun. Uh, whatever you thought about the Ravens uh, game plan last year, you got to you gotta kind of unlearn it because you, you look where they had spent their capital this year. It was Odell Beckham. It was Zay Flowers. They've really beefed up the receiving core in a meaningful way. I don't, I don't think that Lamar Jackson is going to throw the ball 600 times this season, like we saw from some of those Tampa offenses. Um, but he's not going to have another year where it's like 380 or 400 pass attempts. He is in a blow-up spot in the opener against Houston. Uh, I think he's a really strong candidate to finish as the overall QB1 this week. You mentioned Munkin. Creativity was part of what really made him stand out even at the college level, right? I think Baltimore is one of the hardest teams to scout for their opposition in the first month of the season because nobody really knows what wrinkles have been put into that offense and what Lamar's going to look like with that. I love that. Look, Good work by you. See, it, it, this show runs so much smoother when Harmon's not here trash talking me. I'm just saying, uh, you mentioned Austin <laughs> Eckler and the Chargers offense. Obviously, Eckler is a superstar, and uh, he's a superstar that joins the Yahoo fans 
fantasy football show every week uh, with the Eckler's Edge podcast. This week, he reminded everybody, stay out of his mentions. Check it out. That's what makes, you know, football so great is um, there's these ups and downs. There's these there's these trenches that you get into where it's like, man, we got to crawl out of this thing. Like we're, we're in a in a slump right now. If you're going to trade someone like myself that has been proven, like there always is that potential that they come back and actually do play at the expectation. So, hey, we go through ups and downs. Not every player has an amazing game every single flipping game. And so week one, I don't want to see, oh, Austin. What, why did you what this happened ah, ah people freaking out like ah like calm yourself uh, because this is a long season um and and there's more games to be played and if i do go out there and score 40 points i don't want to hear you're the best all this stuff because look yeah appreciate it yeah appreciate it but don't don't get too high don't get too low like let's stay consistent let's keep pushing right i want motivation i don't want these people that are bandwagoners uh, i want people that are like hey austin i appreciate that good work let's go let's go out there and do it again and gentlemen, we've been talking a lot about the whole season what to look for week one. But I think the Bills are a really curious part of this conversation, right? Because as I said earlier at the beginning of the show, there were 13 and 3 team last year that had a lot of things go the wrong way, and they were still 13 and 3. It raises some fantasy questions with them because when you look at that offense, I mean Josh Allen's a given, but you've also got Gabe Davis, James Cook. Like this offense seems hard to project in my mind, Matt. What do you what do you think of the Bills as a fantasy play offensively? Yeah, it's interesting because there's kind of this weird feeling about the Bills where maybe they've missed their window or maybe they've taken a step back or hey, like uh, maybe this is an offense like not as fruitful in fantasy as we thought. This team was number two in EPA per play last year and number two in offensive success rate. They were a great offense. And oh, by the way, their quarterback had an elbow injury for like half of the season. So my expectations for Buffalo are really high this year. They're my Super Bowl pick. I think this offense is better this year than it was last year. Like they've sprinkled just enough on top of what the identity is here, which is Josh Allen. And of course, my guy, Stefan Diggs as the number one receiver. I think Gabe Davis is kind of gotten a bad rap just because you overdrafted him out there people just because you overdrafted him last year when I told you not to do that doesn't mean he's a bad player he's just a limited player who can take the top off a defense he plays an important role here as the vertical receiver but James Cook is in his second year I think he can take a big step as the starting running back and Dalton Kincaid man like this guy's gonna be a matchup nightmare for them so I think the Bills offense was good last year I think it will be even better even more fruitful for fantasy here in 2023. You mentioned Dalton Kincaid, and Andy, I want to get your thoughts on this, because if you go back to the draft, I feel like they really drafted Dalton Kincaid because not just because he's a great tight end, but he was kind of the best receiver on the board right there. Like, I I just can't figure out what to do with him from a fantasy perspective. Yeah, first of all, we definitely don't want to relitigate the Gabe Davis wars from uh, last offseason. That was that was no fun. Uh, Do we? We don't want to do it. I'm ready to do it. (laughs) You, you seem you seem a little bit more ready to do it than I am. I don't I don't ever need to revisit that topic again. Um, Dalton Kincaid is super interesting because actually the the Bills um, you, you look at them over the last few seasons they almost never put two tight ends on the field right like they they are at, at the bottom of the league in terms of like percentage of snaps with with two tight ends out there now like they've paid Dawson Knox and he's a good player and he's like a circle of trust player for Josh Allen. Um, I think if they're going to do it, it it really indicates that Kincaid is just a slot receiver and you need to you need to not think about him as a tight end at all. Part of the reason that it is a difficult adjustment at that position for rookies is that you're really a part of like multiple position groups, right? You're part of the offensive line. You're part of the receiving core. There's a lot to learn if they if they kind of spoon feed him a little bit and he's really just you know an interior receiver i think that's the best path to value for him because like knox isn't going away and again they very rarely played two tight ends simultaneously in the last few years i think a lot of us overestimated last year ken dorsey stepping in as the offensive coordinator as a seamless transition it obviously wasn't And you could see that when we got into red zone efficiency, particularly. I mean, you can watch a highlight reel of bad throws by Josh Allen in the red zone that cost the Bills football games. And again, they were still 13 and three. If Buffalo was able to write some of those going into the season, I think the numbers could be absolutely even bigger and more explosive. And all of a sudden, the Bills put themselves in situations where they could have the top seed. They could have home field advantage. And I'm not sure what the playoffs look like if Kansas City and Cincinnati have to go to Buffalo to try and win their way in to the 
Super Bowl. Now, obviously, we got to get everybody ready. We want to get more more questions in. So we're going to do it with a little bit of hurry up here. All right. We're going to run some pace here. We're going to put some time on the clock. We'll have a 25 second play clock. We'll put the scenarios up and then a whistle will go off in our ears and we will hope that we handle it better than they did on Always Sunny in Philadelphia when the random noises happen. Are you gentlemen ready for the 25 second clock? And we start here. Standard scoring flex option. I'm going to say before the clock starts. Andy, take it, take it away. Brian Robinson Jr. or James Conner? Who you got? Yeah, these are both really good plays. I'm going to go with James Conner just on volume. Talked about Antonio Gibson a little bit earlier. I think he's just going to split carries, split touches pretty evenly with Robinson. That kind of limits the ceiling a little bit. So give me Conner here. Wow, you did that so quickly. The whistle hasn't gone. Let the whistle go. And I just, <laughs> there we go. Uh, all right, Chig or Komet? Thank you for not making me pronounce Chig's last name. Brooks or Van Jefferson, both full PPR. Matt, what do you think? Oh, boy. All right. Well, hey, I'm not going to do the Greg Roman offense. I'm going to get this thing done quickly. I think Chigo Quanquo is a little bit better bet than Cole Komet. I don't feel great about the Titans going in New Orleans, but he's going to be better than somebody on the Bears offense at this point. And then I'll go Van Jefferson, who's going to be the number one receiver for the Rams. I kind of think is a little underrated, a little bit better than Traylon Burks right now. Oh, well done by you. Let's bring the next play oh. up. And this one comes from SeaWorld. Not sure if I should roll out Brees Hall or bench him for Swift. Do y'all think he's ready? Is Swift the lead back? Not Taylor. What do you think, Andy? Oh, I think I hate this question, and I'm probably going to have to filibuster here, and I'm definitely taking the full clock on this one. Um, these are these are two really tricky players because we don't know what that Philly backfield is going to look like, and they're calling like three or four different guys the, the number one back. Um, I would lean Swift, but it's really a, a soft lean here. Um, oh, man. Wow. Thank goodness I don't have to disrespect Brees Hall. We're not, I'm, I'm not proud of that. I thought we were better than that. Let's go to the next one. AR, start two, sit one in standard league. Miles Sanders, J.K. Dobbins, Jameer Gibbs. What do you got, Matt? Well, nothing worse than starting your Thursday off, benching a guy who has in a high-scoring game who could go off. But I think Jameer Gibbs in a standard league. If this was PPR, <laughs> I think you'd throw him out there. But he's the guy I'm sitting here because, again, I think you're mostly counting on passing game equity when he's going to be splitting carries with David Montgomery, where the other two guys are clearly the RB1 on their team. Oh, perfect that, ending. You that. just landed that. Wow, that is professional. Next up, half PPR, Javante, David Montgomery, Raheem Mostert. Uh, what do you got, Andy? Yeah, I got Raheem Mostert here, and I feel really good about it. He's First of all, he's got a matchup that that everybody crushed last year. The, the Chargers allowed 5.4 yards per carry to opposing rushers. I, like, you got to use Raheem Mostert while he's healthy. Do I think he's a great bet over the full season? No, but in week one in this matchup, I think he's absolutely spectacular. Oh, oh and just before the buzzer, that one counts. All right, we got another one here. Uh, James Cook, Khalil Herbert, or Ramondre Stevenson, pick one. What do you got, Matt? What do you think? Yo, you drafted Ramondre Stevenson in like the third round, okay? He, he's the answer here. I don't even need the rest of the clock. Speed the rest of the clock off. I get it. You're worried about Ezekiel Elliott. Don't be. Ramondre is still the lead back here. It should be a pretty decent home field environment for him. Again, I'm just saying things now to fill the clock, but Stevenson's the guy. Uh, that's so much cockiness right there. All right, Drake London or Mike Williams week one. What do you think, Andy? Yeah, I'm going to lean Mike Williams in what should be a shootout of a I think the total in that one is 51. Um, Williams, another guy who like, while he's healthy and while that offense is humming, you definitely want to play him. I think the ceiling is a little bit higher there. I love London as a player. I think these, these are both going to be really good options throughout the season. I'd love to know who your other receivers are because this seems like a pretty stacked core. Oh, we've got more. Mostert or Herbert and half PPR. Matt, what do you think? I do think these two are pretty close. Uh, I think that Khalil Herbert's in a good spot there against a Green Bay run defense that gave up a lot of production last year. Always gives up a lot of production on the ground. But again, Raheem Mostert is here for a good time, but he ain't here for a long time, folks. So you've got to play him while he's available, especially against a Chargers defense that was 31st in rushing success rate allowed last year. Oh, so good on the landing, too. One more for you. Pickens are in Jigba. What do you think, Andy? Yeah, I want to I want to go George Pickens here um, and a, a little bit of a limited player and he's probably going to be a spike player. There'll be big weeks. There'll be slow weeks. Um, I would just go ahead and sit the rookie who's probably, you know, third in the receiving hierarchy to open the season. And I, I would go for the big play guy in a game where Pittsburgh just should be throwing throughout. Oh, and with time, just guys, like, can I just be honest? 
I now know what Steve Harvey feels like, obviously. Like, it's a lot of pressure, 25 seconds. If I screw up the read, you don't have enough time to get the answer out. I almost failed you a couple of times, Matt. Like, I felt like I could have been a little cleaner on that. Like, I was pinching you in on the play clock. Like, it's a lot of pressure, man. I, you know, we, we're going to have to truncate these things, y'all. Like, you're going to have to get less names in if I'm going to read it in 25 seconds. Uh, and you guys should join us every single Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern. New time for the show. We're here from 7 p.m. Eastern all the way to kick off every single week. The conversation doesn't stop here though you can keep up with the latest analysis daily content and our podcast at yahoo fantasy throughout the week super easy to find we got a lot of great stuff coming at you as football season starts so make sure you get out there you subscribe to that rate review all the podcasts give us five stars when you do all of that please and check in back sunday morning for your latest on player injuries and even better our own scott bianowski will be answering your questions on social media it's all there for you good luck with week one underway Matt, Andy, I appreciate you guys letting me crash the party. This is going to be a hell of a year. It's going to be a hell of a blast. To everybody behind the scenes that makes this show happen every week, we thank you. To you guys for watching, thank you for hanging out with us. Come back, see us next week.